nobody in this service today can pat themselves and say, well, I saved myself. It's a delusion. It's false. It's against the word of God. Resurrection power comes from the voice of God. When he speaks, the dead respond. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. And by the way, uh, in our prayer meeting this morning, uh, Megan actually read this pa- passage out loud uh, to us in the prayer meeting. Uh, you can say, well, hello, it's a resurrection passage. Well, there's a lot of resurrection passages in this book. Um, and I'm just telling you, I feel it was just a complete confirmation of where we're going. And I'm sure... Megan didn't just do it for the sake of it. She felt very prompted of the Spirit. So I I believe there's something in this passage for us this morning that we need to take a hold of and who knows what God wants to do through this reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, We are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen. Amen? Amen. He is risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So I've called this message this morning, Because he rose, we rise, spiritually and physically. Because he rose, we rise, spiritually and physically. The resurrection of Jesus is no small thing, would you agree? It is central and it's pivotal to our faith. If it did not happen, then we are of all men most miserable today. In fact... This service this morning would be a religious sham if Jesus is not risen. And also, our, va- our faith would be in vain this morning. In fact, we would be deceived. If Jesus did not defeat the grave 2,000 years ago, then the Old Testament prophet or prophecies are a religious fabrication and Jesus is a liar. But everything that was predicted in the Old Testament And everything that Jesus Christ predicted actually happened. And it happened to the minutest detail. And I don't have time this morning to go into all the things that were prophesied in the Old Testament that Christ perfectly fulfilled. But I can assure you this morning, this service is not a religious sham this morning. And our faith is not in vain this morning. He is risen. Do you know that there was over 500 witnesses to his physical resurrection? 500 witnesses. And I can tell you as a former police officer, I was always happy if I could get two witnesses to prove a fact. Um, If an accident happened, you always wanted at least two uh, independent witnesses. If you get three, you were like over the moon because you knew that would be enough in court to prove a fact. But you had 500 solid witnesses walking about Israel back in the day who could say, I saw him. I saw the risen Christ. What he said, he actually fulfilled it. But it wasn't just that all these blind, kind of prejudiced disciples believed. I believe they were smart men. They were, they were men that, that would have absolutely question things if Jesus hadn't risen. But also you had that, um, that great doubter among the disciples, Thomas. And Thomas wasn't buying into anything unless he could personally 
actually stick his finger into the nail prints in Jesus' hand. He was a witness. In fact, he ended up losing his life for this same Christ, this risen Christ. But another powerful thing that proves this is many of the persecutors of Christ, including the Roman soldiers, um, many of his detractors and skeptics ended up embracing him and becoming some of his greatest witnesses. Whether it was the religious Jews or whether it was the secular Roman soldiers, many of them ended up being strong followers of Christ. So is it any surprise that Christianity just spread like wildfire? It went north, south, east and west. And a few years after the cross, the gospel had actually went to the ends of the earth. This is such a mighty um, thing that we're talking about this morning. Um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, All of Christianity depends on the fact of Jesus' empty tomb and of the future hope of the resurrection to life of all believers. Jesus did not simply live a perfect life and die upon a cross to atone for our sins. He also rose from the dead to overcome death. In a world that sees people as nothing more than mere animals who are destined to die and decompose, the message that believers will live forever with Jesus Christ if they believe in him is a message of great hope. All who flee sin and come to Jesus are promised to live with him forever in the new heaven and new earth. Would you agree with that? Thank God for ten of you. Okay. Well, I'm not going to dwell too long on the actual Easter events this morning. But I want to actually focus in on the result of the Easter events. What it actually produced. And that is because we need to experientially know what Jesus secured for imperfect sinful creatures like you and me through Christ's early earthly ministry is actually affecting us today. It's easy, we could spend an hour talking about what he did, but what effect has that had upon us? Or has it had any effect upon us? To understand why Jesus came, we also need to know what the problem was. There was a problem. There was a big problem. There was a major problem. And that problem was sin. The day that Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, they actually spiritually died that day. Um, as a result, they were separated from God spiritually and physically. Um, Adam and Eve were forced out of the Garden of Eden and they ended up carrying their own guilt, their own shame, their own condemnation. They were separated from God. They were separated from the life of God. They were separated from communion with God. They weren't there was no relationship. Um, and this is seen in the fact that the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they sinned was they ran from God, they hid themselves from God, and then they started to cover themselves up with what they thought was a kind of smart idea. So can you see already there was a, there was a breakdown, there was a problem, there was an issue. And again, I don't want to get into the whole Garden of Eden story today. I don't want to get distracted on that. But I want to quote one verse here. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So everyone out there today, or if there's anyone in here this morning, that is outside of Christ, that does not know him, um, they're spiritually dead. Um, when a person is literally and properly dead, they're dead. Would you agree? Um, in case you're not aware, the dead cannot hear. Do you know that? The dead cannot see. The dead cannot understand. Would you agree? They cannot move. They cannot respond. Would you agree with that? I mean, a, a dead body is dead. You can stick a pin into a dead body and they're not going to respond. 
You can scream into their ear, but they're not going to respond. Um, that's because they're dead. Now, I want you to stick with me here because I'm going somewhere. This applies both to the naturally dead as well as the spiritually dead. Please be aware, before someone encounters Jesus, they are literally in a spiritual grave. They're dead. They cannot hear. They cannot see. They cannot understand. They cannot move. They cannot respond. I think we forget that sometimes. I think we give too much credit and think um, maybe we can use persuasive words or whatever. Unless Jesse was anointed of God to share that thing in that moment, his words would have meant nothing to his brother. Nothing. The Bible says that prior to salvation, a man is a spiritual corpse that is dead in sins. They're spiritually blind. They're spiritually deaf. Now, that might explain Romans 3 better. Sometimes we read Romans 3, 3 and I think we kind of read over it and we kind of it becomes too familiar to us. But listen to what Romans say, 3 says in regard to the ungodly. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. If this is true, and it is, then we need help to effectively respond to the instruction of God. Would you agree? You know, God can say, do this, but unless He wakens you out of your death, you're not going to get it. Um, there are a lot of people out there today that may give the impression that they're alive, but they're dead. I'm here to tell you that if they're outside of Christ, they're dead men walking. That person that you're working with, that family friend, that next door neighbor that you t try to talk to spiritually and you wonder why they're not getting it, well, there's a problem. They're dead. Uh, don't get frustrated. The Bible says they're dead. This should actually cause you to throw yourself upon God and cry for help. Lord, I can't raise a dead man some of you may be familiar with that text in 1st Timothy 5 6 she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth that's a big speak I don't know whether you've ever considered that passage but this woman here may seem outwardly alive she may seem outwardly happy she may seem outwardly to have everything that she wants she's living in pleasure but she's miserable she's empty she's a child of the devil and she's dead while she lives it's obvious from this reading that paul is not talking about physical death but rather spiritual death after all she is, he says she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth so physically she's alive would you agree? Physically, she's alive. But spiritually, she's dead. When you go out into this world, you're going out into a graveyard. People are spiritually dead all around us. Um, and then we wonder why they don't get it. They wonder why they're antagonistic to what we have. They're just not there. They're not getting it. They don't understand. Now, please stick with me this morning. I'm going somewhere. What man in general, therefore, requires is divine intervention, which would raise them from the wretched repercussions of dual death. Okay? Um, remember this, that every single human being has the threat of dual death over them, which is spiritual death, but also physical death. Now to rescue man from this inevitable doom, Christ had to help us. He had to come to this earth 2,000 years ago. Christ had to defeat sin. Okay? Because sin was the source of man's enslavement. But Jesus had to defeat death, or the grave would have had a victory over us. This meant 
that neither of these things would have any power over God's people. So, if the fall was the greatest tragedy that ever hit this world, then the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ was the biggest blessing. Okay? He is risen. He's not there. He's not in the grave could not hold him down. Um, so Jesus basically confronted everything that was against us, everything that was holding us down, everything that was condemning us. He had to defeat it. He had to confront it. He had to overcome it. He had to be that thing that, that we couldn't be. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. But how can a spiritually dead person believe? We've got a problem here. I mean, he's saying whoever believes is going to overcome death but how can he believe I put it to you they need help they need supernatural intervention now this is one of those messages that honestly it's a mixture of devotional theological and also evangelistic at the one time and it seems like maybe once a year maybe twice a year God will give me a message like that because I get it this is, this is deep stuff here this is deep theology but it's also evangelistic and it's devotional for us, God's people. Um, Jesus said in John 5.21, and I want you to really take a hold of this. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Now, the word quickeneth here means to cause, to live, to make alive, to give life and to give spiritual power to arouse and to invigorate. Now the only possible way that a physically dead man or a spiritually dead man can move from death to life is through responding to his quickening voice. This is how God raises the dead. He speaks. He speaks. By the way, there's nothing like hearing the quickening voice of God. Christian, there was a time where you were spiritually dead and you heard his voice and it wasn't an outward cry. It was something that entered your heart and changed you forever. Oh, Amen? Amen? Romans 4.17 tells us that God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Once he speaks life, life appears. But I want you to know that it is through him, not through you. Him, him, or him. It's when he speaks, his voice alone brings life to the dead. So how does a spiritually dead man come to life? How does a physically dead man come out of the grave? They need resurrected. Be no, under no illusion, only God can do that. You cannot raise yourself from a spiritual grave any more than you can raise yourself from a physical grave. Seriously, I think if we grasp this today, it's going to maybe change our theology forever. You do not have the ability to get out of such a state of your own devices. Do you remember when Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus? How hopeless was that? I mean, in the natural. How hopeless was Lazarus's condition? He was so dead, he actually stunk. And I'm telling you, and I, we have to be real today because the Word of God is real. That that was as dead as you were. You were so dead in your sin that you stunk. You stunk. But look what happened to this seemingly hopeless condition, this dark situation. It says in John 11.43 that he, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead come forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. 
what made the difference? His voice. His voice. When he speaks, his voice raises the dead. I'm telling you, this gets rid of all the religious gimmicks out there. All the programs that we have today to entice people to come into church and make a decision. If people don't hear his voice, then they're not going to be raised from the grave of their sin. And then we wonder why they spend 30, 40, 50 years professing Christ, but yet they continue in their sin. It's because they're not resurrected from the dead. I think we've so diluted the new birth today that we underestimate the power contained in the voice of God. Salvation is not some mere religious decision. It is a supernatural act. That's why with your kids, with your grandkids, with your best friends, with family members that you love dearly, your prayer should be, Lord, would you speak to them? Would you speak with that quickening voice? Every time you see quickening in the Bible, underline it. Because it's, it's, it's a very potent word. That's the key to true salvation. The quickening voice of God. The transition from death to life, both spiritually and physically, occurs by way of resurrection. By the way, there's a day coming when that trumpet sounds. When all that are in the grave are going to hear his voice. He's going to call all men forward. That trumpet will sound and he will call them out of the graves. And they will come out of the graves to stand before him and account for their lives. Now I want you to, to come close here. And I want to make it personal today. Do you realize that the exact same supernatural voice that physically raised Lazarus from the dead is the exact same supernatural voice that raised you from the dead, your spiritual death. The exact same voice. It had to be something supernatural to change who you are. It, it wasn't a mere religious decision. See, that's the difference between Christianity and Islam. That's the difference between Christianity and all the cults. It's all about man doing this and that and whatever to change himself. But we know we can't change ourselves. We know within ourselves that our flesh is so stubborn and so blind and deaf and ignorant that we cannot change ourselves. Like Lazarus in the grave come out, a sinner can hear his quickening voice and can come out of the grave even this morning. You can come into this place spiritually dead. And through this weak, frail preacher, you can hear the voice of God. And suddenly that voice will change you for time and eternity. Amen. The voice of God. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two fourteen, For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I don't know whether you've ever thought about that in regard to this subject. Okay, and I want to just for a few moments, and I'm going to put my theology hat on for like two minutes. So please lock the doors, don't run out. Okay, so theologians rightly speak about the general call or the external call, okay? Which is preached to the masses. Okay, so would you agree that there's a general call to all men to repent? Unless ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Remember, Noah preached for 120 years. He was a righteous preacher and he preached that message of repentance. How many actually took on board what he said? Well, seven heard him and he was number eight. Okay? But did that stop him preaching faithfully for those 120 years? So he, the general call was out there, but it was a general call ultimately to judgment for them. Okay? But there's a big difference between the general call or the external call and the effectual call or the personal call or the internal call. Okay? Uh, Ligonier Ministries explains it like this. Part of the problem here today is that many Christians fail to distinguish between the external call of the gospel and the inward call of the Holy Spirit. 
End of quote. See, the call goes out to the whosoever. And that's why it says many are called. But few accept that message. Would you agree? Few are chosen. Or few are elect. That's what the word chosen means, by the way. Per Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said this. It is said many are called, but few are chosen. This is a general call which many men, yea, all men reject, unless there comes after it the personal particular call which makes us Christians. Okay, I'll quote another verse here. Um, and it's a familiar verse that most of you probably could have memorized or you know. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Okay, I don't know whether you've ever considered this verse in regard to this subject. So I'm sure you would all agree with me that this passage is not talking about the external call. Because things are not going to work out for the good of those who reject Christ. Amen, Jesse? The, what you shared with your brother is true. So we can't apply this to the, the general call. I put it to you that this is a particular or the personal call where God gets inside a man's heart, convicts them, shows them exactly who they are, and then he changes them. Um, this is talking about those who truly internally hear his voice. Tell me this. When you sit under the preaching of the Word of God, whenever you open that book, can you hear His voice? Amen. Yeah. Do you hear His voice? Or are you just reading words? Like religious words that you know are righteous words and you know like, hey, this is a very wholesome book. Or is this book alive to you? When you read this book, God just gets right in there where no human being can get in there. No psychologist, no doctor, uh, no religious fanatic can get into your heart only he can get in when you come under the preaching of the word of god are you convicted does the word of god like penetrate through or does it just fly over your head are you just saying i wish he would get done and i want to get out and i want to get my e easter lunch seriously no but we we have to get to the root of like who are we are we getting it are we getting it or are we just are we captivated with dead religion? I think Cameron quoted this in the prayer meeting this morning. Jesus said in John 10, 27, 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you see, if you're a true sheep or a true lamb in this place this morning, you hear his voice. You recognize his voice. And... Another passage says, a stranger they will not follow. Christians follow his voice. There's nothing like the voice of God. What a mighty voice. Thank God for that voice. That voice changed this rebel. This rebel who loved his sin, who's full of pride, thought he knew it all. And suddenly he realized he knew nothing. And I come to one who knew everything. Hallelujah. And I can tell you that unless you have got to the stage in your life where you throw up the hands and you say, Lord, I'm guilty. I don't know anything, but I am dependent upon your voice. It's your voice that is going to take me to heaven. It's your voice that's going to change me. It's your voice that's going to change those desires that I have. I can't change myself. Do you know that between 2 and 2.2 .2 billion people on this earth at the moment, claim to be Christian. Between 2 and 2.2 .2 billion. Isn't that incredible? But how many of them truly know His voice? How many? Do you not think that if there was 2.2 .2 billion born-again believers on this earth, it would be a different world? Like in the Ukraine today, there's a war going on between two nations that profess to be Christian. Do you know that? In Northern Ireland, there was terrorism for 35 years of 
between two tribes who both claim to be Christian. I'm telling you, many profess they've heard the external call, but they have never, ever heard the internal call. Because once that internal call comes in, it leaves a mark. It changes you. Did you ever notice whenever you're reading the the Gospels that Jesus would say um, things like this? If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Like, I'm sure people like, hello, like he looks around and like, we've all got ears. You ever thought that? Like, I mean, he said that many times, those that have ears to hear, let them hear. But, and, and he would say other times, they've got ears to hear, but they don't hear. So what they would do is they would hear Jesus talking, but they wouldn't hear Jesus talking. Okay, so there's the external call, but they weren't getting the internal call. It, just, it was just flying over their heads. Brother, sister, please do not treat the voice of God lightly. Even as believers, I think we have a habit of just fobbing God off whenever He's speaking to us. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, today, if ye will hear His voice, what does He say? Harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation. So even as a believer, you have the ability to harden your heart against the voice of God. It could be a circumstance in life. It could be something a preacher has done to you. It could be something that a Christian has done to you that you can suddenly say, you know what? It's not worth it. But I'm telling you what, if you hear His voice, I urge you to respond to His voice. Respond today when you have opportunity for the lost, for the wicked. If you come into a service like this and you hear His voice, Respond to his voice. If you have the ability to respond, you know that he's on your case. Amen? Amen. That his voice has got through to your heart and has given you the ability to believe. And I know I've heard a lot of the arguments. Well, you know, well, it's my faith. You know, that I have the ability to believe. Do you? What does it say? For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man boast. Uh, Paul testified in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ that liveth in me, and the life that I now live, I live through the faith of the Son of God. So even the faith that you have, you can't pat yourself on the back and expect Jesus to give you a high five whenever you go through the pearly gates and say, oh, Ron, I just appreciated your faith on earth. You like, like, thank you for choosing me and not Buddha. Or Joseph Smith. Or any other idiot. <laughs> Seriously, but you think that's what Jesus is going to be there high-fiving us saying, Les, thanks brother, thanks for choosing me. Is that, is that what it's going to be? I can tell you what, we're going to thank him for speaking to us. For waking us up, for... For having the grace, the mercy, the love to actually to care for us. By the way, Jesus cares for sinners. Do you remember when the prophet Ezekiel was facing a pretty hopeless sight in the Valley of Dry Bones? The nation of Israel was spiritually dead. Okay? So in Ezekiel 37, 3 God speaks unto the prophet and he says, Son of man, can these bones live? And what did the prophet say? Oh, oh Lord God, thou knowest. <laughs> you know, I don't fully know. What, I, I, kind of, I can really identify with it. It's kind of, he's looking at a hopeless scene here and he, that's a smart answer. Huh? I think that's a wise man who says that, Lord, thou knowest. <laughs> to me, it doesn't look good. Okay, he's like he's looking at a field full of dead, dead, be- dead bones. So he says, "O oh Lord, thou knowest." And again, he said unto me, "Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Amen. There's the gospel message. Amen? Amen? So, was it the prophet that caused these bones to come to life? Ezekiel 37, 12. Therefore prophesy, therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. And then shall ye know that I am the Lord. I the Lord have spoken it and performed it. Do you know what? This is the sovereignty of God written all over this. Would you agree? He causes it. He performs it. So nobody in this service today can pat themselves and say, well, I saved myself. It's a delusion. It's False, it's against the word of God. Resurrection power comes from the voice of God. When he speaks, the dead respond. In fact, Curtis Pred in the prayer meeting this morning, I don't know whether he remembers it, but he says, your voice has the ability to raise the dead. By the way, it's good to come to a prayer meeting in this church because God can confirm a lot of what you're feeling. The Spirit of God was moving this morning. I, Whenever I was a young police officer and I'd come back to the Lord, um, many times I would get into debates with a lot of the, the guys that are heathens or a lot of the guys that were um, maybe religious dead ducks. Okay? Like they always, the Irish like a fight. Okay? They, they love, they're always spoiling for a fight. But I used to get into a lot of debates with guys in the Masonic Lodge. And honestly, they were so stubborn. Like, I had to bait them for hours. Like, you were stuck in a, a security sanger for like 12 hours. And we'd be back and forth, and they would be back and forth. And it used to leave me drained. I used to go home from work really drained. Like, I'm like, these guys aren't getting it. Like, they're not getting it. And the Lord really convicted me that I was using my own religious arguments. And he really led on my heart to, to, to quote scripture. So I remember, um, I remember one day, like I remember going in and saying, right, tonight I'm going to just quote the Bible. So this guy would say this, but I would say the Bible says. And I would quote it word for word. And you know what? It dumbfounded the guy. Like, there was one guy especially, like he was a high-ranking uh, mason. He knew all, the, he knew all the, his rituals. He knew everything word for word. And I was studying it from a Christian perspective. But every time I quoted the word, it was like he was getting a thump on the chin. You know, he said, all roads lead to God. God's a love of God of, of grace and mercy. He, he's not going to condemn people to hell. All roads lead to God. I would say, there's one God. And there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Then he would go on with, uh, said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And it would go on like that. And you know what? The guy was exhausted. The guy was like, his guard was down. And he's like, I can't argue with that. Why? There was a power with the word of God. You see, when we quote the word of God, it's the voice of God. And the voice of God is a quickening voice. And that voice is a voice that raises the dead. Now, let me just tell you, just I don't know the full end of this story, but someday it wouldn't surprise me if that guy is in heaven. I don't know, whenever I was there, he, he never bowed the knee. Um, I've never heard to this day that he bowed the knee. But one thing I heard a few months after that, so that guy, I remember praying for this guy, actually. Um, I'll not go into what my prayer was, because it was pretty radical. Okay? And the next day, he, or that night, he didn't turn up for work. And he was off work for about three months. His wife during the night actually lost her baby. And 
he was off for three months and then he come back and that guy that was really hostile toward me was very soft. And he actually told me in that three months his wife got born again. His wife got born again. Now, I don't know the end of this story, so I can't tell you the end at the moment. But it wouldn't be surprise me someday that I wouldn't get an email or so, uh, just to tell me the end of that story is Bob got saved. But I'm here to tell you, not because of this preacher or at that time police officer, but because God took my feeble words, but his potent scripture and changed the life. And I think if we realize the power of this book, I think we would quote it more. Amen? Amen. I think those around us need to say, but the Bible says. They can talk about politics, but the Bible says. They can talk about all the different beliefs out there, but the Bible says. They can talk about all the dead religion, but the Bible says. And I'm telling you, if you have a confidence in that voice, that voice can raise the dead. Let us pray. Sinclair Ferguson said this, Our old status lies in his tomb. A new status is ours through his resurrection. You're living today. Thank God you're alive. Physically and spiritually you're alive. Amen? Thank God you've got ears to hear. There might be somebody in here this morning and maybe you say, I feel dead spiritually. I just don't feel that I'm getting it. And... I've heard his voice today. I, I want him. I want Jesus in my life. I want to know the joys, joy of sins forgiven. I want to commit my life to Christ. Is there someone here this morning that's maybe backslidden? Maybe you've just wandered from his voice, listening to his voice, to listening to your own voice or the voice of the devil, and you're sick and tired of that alien voice. You know that God's voice is the only voice that matters. It's the only voice that gives you peace perspective uh, it's the only voice to listen to his voice is precious there is nothing like the voice of God amen it's sweet it just does something to our spirit that no other voice does when he tells you that he loves you it's everything amen when he tells you that he cares it's everything there's no other voice that can satisfy you um, and I just want to just encourage you just to ask the Lord just to, just to speak directly to you personally what he wants you to do this preacher doesn't need to give you an A to Z amen Jesus can speak to you and tell you what he wants you to do when he wants you to do it and just ask him to forgive you for anything that's there that's an offense to him anything that's holding you back this morning just ask him to forgive you just thank him for an empty tomb today Thank Him for a cross today. Thank, thank Him that He is risen. Thank Him that He cares for you personally. That you have heard the personal call of the Lord this morning. Personally to your heart. Not just to your neighbor, but to you personally. Father, I just thank You for Your truth this morning. Thank You for this wonderful, deep truth about the voice of God. And Lord, I pray that we would realize there's no resurrection without the voice of God. And Lord, we thank you that we've heard that voice. And the only way that we could respond to that voice is because you give us the ability to respond. You caused us. You caused us to rise up out of the grave. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you care. Thank you that you love us. Sinful creatures that fall so short of your perfection. Thank you that you're gracious. Lord, I thank you that it's not three strikes and you're out or none of us will be here today. None of us deserve it, Lord. That's why it's called grace. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand this morning.